Good afternoon, everyone. It sure is good to have everyone back. Probably feeling just a little sleepy because if you ate downstairs with us, you probably ate a little too much. and So we just need to gird up our loins and get ready for a, a good uh, afternoon worship. I would like to give a quick rundown of the prayer list this morning. I will just go over the addition since it was just a few minutes ago. It seems like that we, that we went over the prayer list. Uh... We did add the family of John Holland to the prayer list. John Holland, a member of Chickamauga, passed away this past week. So please keep that family in your prayers. Uh, the celebration of life will be held at the church building in Chickamauga, and that will be later in May. So it's going to be uh, a little bit further away. We also added Debbie Dodson to the prayer list. She's having some bronchitis and uh, just feeling uh, pretty weak and not feeling great. So please pray for her as she's out today. Angela McCauley is home from the hospital and feeling much, much better, so we're glad she had a good day today and hope that, that that continues. Uh, one more that we're going to add this afternoon that I didn't get to make this morning is the family of Debbie Russ. Debbie Russ passed away, and we need to keep that family in our prayers as well. Other announcements we need to Remember, don't forget the Tuesday morning Bible class at 10 a.m. If you're able to be here for that, that will be good. Uh, April 30th will be the axe throwing event. Uh, we'll start out here at the building at 11 o'clock on April 30th. We'll have a meal and some singing and a devotional. And then we'll go down to the axe throwing place here in Lafayette. 
there's a sign up sheet for that on the bulletin board. There's a sign up sheet for the axe throwing and a sign up sheet to bring food for the meal that we're going to have here at 11. Don't forget, youth led worship will be May 1st. Uh, and the evening worship, Junior's going to be speaking for us, so we certainly need to encourage him uh, with our attendance as well as encourage each other. We do have the uh, dates for the next first aid class uh, training. That'll be Saturday, May 21st from noon until 4 p.m. This is for anyone on the medical response team who's not currently certified. So if you have any questions about that, you can call or text Diane. Men's breakfast will be May 7th. Uh, our vacation Bible school begins Sunday, June 5th, so that's coming up real, real soon. So keep that in your prayers and be ready to invite people and come your own self. There'll be classes for all ages. And also we added this morning that uh, May 28th, that's the Saturday before uh, Labor Day, Memorial Day, not Labor Day, Memorial Day, we're going to have a family cookout at Sloppy Floyd uh, State Park. So everybody put May 28th on your calendar, circle it for us to all get together and have a good time. That's all the announcements I have at this time. The proper time, uh, our scripture will be read by Joey Durham, and that'll be Psalm chapter 9. Our opening prayer will be led by J.L., and our closing prayer by Curry. And we'll turn the songs back over to Don. Thank you, Brother Jesse. Before we begin our service, uh, I'd like to commend the people that made the banana pudding <laughs> and a lot of the other things that I ate. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much for contributing what you did. It was wonderful. If you didn't get a chance to, to come to that uh, dinner, please be ready for the next one if you possibly can. I think you'll really enjoy it. Now we're going to get into our worship. The first song tonight will be uh, When All of God's Singers Get Home. And I'm going to be sweet to you. I'm going to let you just keep, keep seated, okay? We'll sing all three verses. I want you to just really sing out. This is a song about two things. God sings, and we're going to be going home on these days. So let's sing it like we mean it, okay? And all God singers, get home. Those who want a song to be like, it's his song Scripture reading. Scripture reading this evening will be Psalm 9. Psalm 9. I will praise you, O Lord, with my whole heart. I will tell you of all your marvelous works. I will be glad and rejoice in you. I will sing praise to your name, O Most High. When my enemies turn back, they shall fall and perish at your presence. For you have maintained my right and, and my cause. You sat on the throne, judging in righteousness. 
You have rebuked the nations. You have destroyed the wicked. You have <clears throat> bottled out their name forever and ever. O oh, enemy, destructions are finished forever. And you have destroyed cities. Even their memory has perished. But the Lord shall endure forever. He has prepared his throne for judgment. He shall judge the world in righteousness. And he shall administer judgment for those for the peoples in unrighteousness. The Lord will also the Lord also will be a refuge for the oppressed, a refuge in times of trouble, and those who know your name will put their trust in you. For you, Lord, have not forsaken those who seek you. Sing praises in to the Lord who dwell in Zion. Declare his deeds among the people when he avenges blood. He remembers them. He does not forget the cry of the humble. Have mercy on me, O Lord. Consider my trouble from those who hate me. You will lift me up from the gates of death, that I may tell of your praise in all the ga- in, in the gates of the daughter of Zion. I will rejoice in your salvation. The nations have sunk down in the pit which they made. In the net which they hid, their own foot is caught. The Lord is known by the judgment he executes. The wicked is snared in the work of his own hands. The wicked shall be turned into hell, and all the nations that forget God. For the needy shall not always be forgotten. The expectations of the poor shall not perish forever. Arise, O Lord, do not let man prevail. Let the nations be judged in your sight. Put them in fear, O Lord, that the nations may know themselves to be but men. Very good job, Joe. We thank you so much for reading that Psalms 9. That's wonderful. Our next song is Sing and Be Happy, 841, a song we all know well. And since we know it well, we're going to sing it well, aren't we? There you go. We need to sing and be happy. Thank you. 
God bless every one of you. It's wonderful. Brother J.L., would you want to come up there and have a prayer? Brother J.L. is going to lead us in a prayer at this time. Let us pray. Our Father, whose art in heaven, creator of heaven, creator of earth, creator of all things, our Lord and our God. Father, we thank you for this time in our worship service when we can quietly pause to remember that moment. When Jesus died upon the cross for our many sins. In our busy life, we too often forget that we are yours and that you have bought us with a price. Father, forgive us of our many sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us in the path of righteousness and restore a right spirit within us. Father, we pray for all of our sick. You know who they are, and you know their condition. Restore them to their normal health. Bless them with many more days serving you in the future. For those who have lost loved ones, Father, comfort them where comfort is needed. Help us to realize it is pointed for man once to die and then the judgment. The love you have for us, Father, we thank you. A love that not only talk the talk, but a love that also walk the walk. Father, again, we thank you so much. In Jesus' name, I ask all these many blessings. Amen. Thank you, Brother J.L. That wonderful prayer. I'm we'll seeing number 842, Common Love. And it's true, we all share a common love. Oh, <laughs> For the common love over each other, common gift to the Savior, our common bond, holding us to the Lord. For common strength, we will be a common hope for tomorrow. Eight fifty five. Let's see what we have here. God's family. My dexterity is leading me. This will be the song before Brother David Payton comes before us with question and answer tonight. We'll sing all, uh, let's see, we'll sing verses 1 and 3. Do me.
now from David Faden. Good evening. It is great to be here, and it's always so great to see everyone out. I certainly couldn't find a better place in all the world to be than right here with the good folks at the Lafayette Church of Christ. It's been a great day so far. We've had uh, great worship, great singing, prayers, great food, great fellowship. Uh, everything has been great. Joey led us in a great scripture reading. Now, you know, what's, what you don't know is that I called on him about five minutes before service started and asked, could he read that long passage? Without any hesitation, he said yes. And you know, that, that gives that should give us all encouragement. You've got young men who are willing to step up and to lead and, and to do things that are needed in the church. And that, I really appreciate him and, and all of our young ladies and young men for the, the great effort that they do within the body of Christ. Now, um, if you are full, you are no more full than I am. And... Uh, I know when you get full, I know I like to get flat. The recliner, the bed, you name it. Uh, kind of reminds me of when I first started preaching, there was this, this country gentleman, he said, Preacher, you're getting better at preaching. Of course, I smiled, and that made me feel good. He said, when you first started preaching, it took you 20 minutes to put me asleep. He said, no, it only takes 10. And so uh, I'm going to have a hard time staying awake myself. But uh, anyway. We're going to look at questions and answers, and in, in the question and answers tonight, this being the fourth Sunday of the month, there is only one question that we are going to take the time to look at, and the reason I've decided or elected to do just one question is I don't want to just brush this question off and act as if it is not important. It is one that I think is of utmost importance within the Bible. And we want to take the time to examine it and examine it as best as we possibly can. And the question is, can a Christian consume any amount of alcohol? If there is an ongoing debate uh, that has been for ages, centuries, it would be, it would revolve around this particular question because there are those who believe that it is perfectly okay for a Christian to consume alcoholic beverages in a moderate state. In other words, they don't go overboard, but they can moderately drink alcohol, whether it be a beer or a little wine or a little hard liquor or whatever you want to call it. Then there are those who go to the Bible and they say that the Bible completely and utterly forbids the uh, consummation of any amount of alcohol. And you know, it, it doesn't matter what you and I think. It doesn't matter what we feel concerning this question, but rather all that matters is what God's Word has to say, and, and that's the way that we want to approach it. There are four different points that I want us to make as we think about this question, can a Christian consume any amount of alcohol? And the very first thing that I want us to do is I want us to look at the word wine in the Bible. I think we need to start right there. When you think about the word wine in the Bible, it is found some 205 times. Now, that is a combination of both the Old Testament and the New Testament. It's found more times in the Old Testament than it is in the New, but it is found 205 times throughout the Bible. Now, I want us to begin by looking at the Hebrew form of this word, and that would be in the Old Testament. In the Hebrew language, you're going to have basically two words from which this word wine comes. The first word is yayin, and it is literally referring or defined as fermented or what we would think of as intoxicating wine. That's found 134 times in the Old Testament. Then there is the Hebrew word tirosh, which refers to freshly pressed wine or what we might think of as fruit of the vine or fresh squeezed grape. And you're going to see that I want to show you some verses in the Bible where you can see that so plainly. But that word is found some 38 times in the Old Testament. When you come to the New Testament, you look at the Greek language, the word uh, wine is found some 33 times in the New Testament. The only difference is, is it comes from one Greek word, and that's the Greek word koinos. Now, when you see this word, sometimes it refers to 
wine in an uh, intoxicating fashion. And then again, sometimes it is just literally referring to the fruit of the wine, uh, fruit of the vine, or what we would think of as grape juice. Now, what people will do, and, and this is, um, I think, a false argument that, that people will, will make. They will look at these different words and they'll say, okay, sometimes when we see the word wine, then if it's coming from this particular word, it's talking about an intoxicating beverage. And then if it comes from this word, then it's talking about a non-intoxicating beverage. And that does not work. In fact, even though you've got the different words in the Hebrew language, one of the things you'll find out when you study through and look at these words is that sometimes you're going to see the word yayin refer to wine in a good sense, and sometimes you're going to see the word tirosh refer to wine in a bad sense. And so you cannot go and say, okay, this word means this and that word means that. You have to recognize when you study this word that there is a difference in the meaning. And therefore, the way that we conclude is the context must determine the meaning. And so when you've got this difference in definition, what you've got to do is look at the context wherein the verse is found, and then we draw the meaning. We'd say, okay, which meaning is applied or being applied in this passage of Scripture? And language will often give us that understanding. So we look at the word wine. It is found multiple times throughout the Bible. Now, the next thing that we want to do as we think about the word wine is we want to recognize the two different basic kinds of wine that you and I see in the Bible. Number one, there is what we would refer to as intoxicating wine. Remember that this word is found some 138 times. Not always is it talking about intoxicating wine, but many times, in fact, the majority of the times, you will see this word referring to wine that is recognized as strong drink or in an intoxicating fashion. For example, in Leviticus chapter 10, verses 9 and 10, of course, this is instruction that God is giving to the priest, those of, of His people who are identified as priests. And note, if you will, that He says to them, do not drink wine and look at what wine is associated with or intoxicating drink you nor your sons with you when you go into the tabernacle of meeting lest you die excuse me it shall be a statute forever throughout your generation that you may distinguish between holy and unholy and between clean and unclean clearly when you look at that verse and you're asking yourself the question which definition best fits here it is without a doubt that god is forbidding the kind the certain kind of wine that his priests, those who were his servants, were not to drink. And it would lead me to understand that the definition that goes here would be none other than alcoholic wine. So you can see wine in an intoxicating sense. And it's not just there. You can see it many other times, remember. Isaiah chapter 5 and verse 11 is another good example. Woe to those who rise early in the morning that they may follow intoxicating drink, who continue until night, till wine inflames them. And so there's our word wine. Look at the word that it's associated with, intoxicating drink, which would lead us to understand which definition is being applied here in the context of the Scripture. This would be of an alcoholic beverage. And again, what is God doing? He's forbidding that they partake of it. Again, this word comes to the Hebrew word yayin, which refers to literally fermented wine, or intoxicating wine. So sometimes when you and I see that word wine in the Bible, it's going to be talking about intoxicating wine. But then again, sometimes when you and I see it, it is being used in what we would refer to as a non-intoxicating sense. For example, Isaiah 65 and verse 8, Thus says the Lord, as the new wine, there is our word wine, and it's compared, or if you'll notice, got the word new out beside it. New wine is found, note where the new wine is found, in the cluster. Now, what do you think that God is referring to, or what do you think Isaiah has in mind when he's talking about this in the cluster? Well, that's talking about the grape. And so, therefore, you've got the word wine that is referring to freshly squeezed grape juice here in the context of the Scripture. And one says, do not destroy it, for a blessing it is, is in it, so will I do for my servant's sake. 
that I may not destroy them all. Now again, that is the Hebrew word kirosh, which refers to freshly pressed wine. In other words, it's referring to grapes that have been freshly pressed. And so you've got the word wine here and what definition we're going to put to it. From a biblical standpoint, this would be of a non-intoxicating nature. And there are other places throughout the Bible where we can see that. For example, Proverbs chapter 3 and verse 9, honor the Lord with your possessions. Okay, What kind of possessions are we to honor the Lord with? With the first fruits of all your increase. So your barns will be filled with plenty and your vats will overflow. And there's our phrase again, new wine. Now, who is going to be the giver of this new wine? Well, it will naturally be God. Can we honestly say that we believe that God is talking about intoxicating beverage here in the context of Scripture? Absolutely not. And so therefore, the definition that is going to be applied based upon the context has to be talking about the grape juice. And so we can look to the Bible and we can see that sometimes when you see the word wine, it's talking about intoxicating wine. Other times when you see it, it is talking about non-intoxicating wine. The context must determine the meaning. You cannot just look at the Bible and say, oh, there's the word wine. That's talking about fermented wine. Or, oh, there's the word wine. It's talking about non-intoxicating. No, you've got to study the text. Study to show yourself approved unto God. And when you and I do that, then we can clearly see what the Bible says. Now, we've looked at the word wine in the Bible. The second point that we want to make is we want to see what the Bible has to say about drinking wine. And what we want to do is we want to look at what the Old Testament had to say, and then we want to look at what the New Testament had to say. Now, what we're going to do is we're going to focus mainly on the intoxicating wine, what God has to say about it. Because you can see clearly that there is a kind of wine in the Bible that is non-intoxicating. That would refer to grape juice. But the Bible does have a lot to say about intoxicating wine. Let's begin with the Old Testament. And the very first thing that you and I are going to see is that there is a warning against it. We looked at this verse a moment ago in Leviticus chapter 10 in verses 9 and 10 where God is speaking to the priesthood and He gives them a warning, do not drink wine or intoxicating drink. And note, if you will, the stern warning, lest you do what? You think God was serious about His servants, the priests, not drinking intoxicating wine? He even gives a reason why they should not drink of it. Note, if you will, that you may distinguish between holy and unholy and between clean and unclean. What does the drinking of alcoholic beverages do to an individual? It impairs their judgment. It keeps them from being able to make proper and good decisions. Therefore, God not only warns against it, but He also gives reasons as to why He forbids them. Now, I know we're not to the New Testament in what it says about intoxicating drink, but I find it very interesting that this passage was given to the priest. What does the Bible teach us in 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 5 and 9, that you and I are as God's people? Are we not identified as His priests? In the book of 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse 5, we are classified as holy priests. And not just that, in verse 9, we are a royal priesthood. Now, brothers and sisters, if God's priests on the Old Testament were forbidden to drink of alcoholic beverages, how is it that an individual under the new covenant, under a better covenant, under a better system, how can we conclude that it's perfectly fine, okay, and logical for an individual to consume any amount of alcoholic beverages. You cannot stay true to the Bible and come to that conclusion. And, and so you see that warning against wine in Leviticus. It's not just there, but in Proverbs chapter 20 and verse 1, note if you will, and this is not an unfamiliar passage to you, the Bible plainly says that wine is a mocker, and look at what is associated with strong drink. So wine is a mocker, strong drink is raging, and whoever is uh, led astray by it is not wise. Note, if you will, the what happens when an individual consumes wine 
or an individual consumes strong drink, what does it cause them to do? It causes them to be led astray. Now, in order to understand the danger of wine here in this verse, note if you will, that wine is being personified. Wine is being personified, note if you will, as a mocker. Now, what is a mocker? The word mocker is a word that you will see throughout the Old Testament, specifically and particularly in the book of Proverbs. A mocker is an individual who has no respect for other people, for God, or for anything. It's just an individual who doesn't care about anything in life. And, and the Bible has a lot to say about a mocker. We're not going to take the time to look at each one of these verses, but in Proverbs 13 and verse 1, a mocker is identified as one who refuses to listen to instruction. In Proverbs 14 and verse 9, he is an individual who makes fun, makes fun of sin. In other words, when it comes to any kind of sinful action, oh, it's just a, it's just a big joke to this individual. This is an individual, according to Proverbs 15 and verse 12, they hate correction. They hate to be told that they are wrong. And they just will not stand for individuals telling them that they're wrong. In chapter 9 and verse 12, those individuals are going to suffer. And then in Proverbs 19 and verse 29, these individuals are described as a judgment that has been prepared for them. Now, what Solomon is trying to get to you, get you and I to see is that when we consume wine, here's what wine causes us to do. It keeps us from listening to instruction. It causes us to make fun of sin instead of turning away from sin. It keeps us from correction or instruction. We hate instruction. It causes us to suffer. And in the very end, there will be a judgment. That is what you have to look at in order to understand what Solomon is talking about when he says wine is a mocker. Do you think since wine is a mocker that Solomon had any intention that people would look at this verse and say, okay, a lot of wine is mocker. So I can have just a little bit of it and be okay. No. The point that he is making is to stay completely. Oh my goodness, what in the world? I mashed it one time and it went haywire. Let me get back to where I was. Cause boy, it went really quite crazy. Going with it. Oh, we're still in the Old Testament. Which one? Okay, here's the next one. <laughs> Sorry about that. Proverbs 23 and verses 29 through 35. This is probably one of the most detailed passages in the Bible in the Old Testament from the proverb writer that talks about the seriousness of drinking wine. Look at how he begins. Who has woe? Who has sorrow? Who has contentions? Who has complaints? Who has wounds without cause? In other words, it's He's got wounds and he's hurt. He doesn't know where they came from. Who has redness of wine, a redness of eyes? Those who linger long at the wine. Those who go in search of mixed wine. When you read those first couple of verses, is that not a typical description of an individual in a drunken condition? And not necessarily a drunken condition, but maybe the hangover the next day. Uh, th that's their basic description. Look at what it says. Do not look on the wine when it is red, when it sparkles in the cup, when it swirls around smoothly. The idea is that there is a point to where you can look upon wine, and it's not bad, but there's another point in the stage of wine when it's no longer in that unfermented state, when it's reached that fermented state. What does Solomon say? You don't even look at it. When the Bible gives direct command, don't even look at it. How is it that someone can go into the Bible and come to the conclusion that they can partake of it? Note, if you will, what happens when we allow it to become a part of our bodies. At last, it bites like a serpent and sings like a viper. Now, what is it that a serpent and a viper have in common? Both of them contain poison. And both of them, when they bite you, they inject their poison within your body. Do you see the comparison? Do you see the analogy? It is compared to a snake that bites you. Likewise, when an individual takes intoxicating wine of any amount, whether it's a social drink or they are just drunk flat on their face, 
any time that they take it in. The small amount is classified by the teaching of the Bible as what? It's poison. Plain and simple. Note if you will, he continues on, your eyes will see strange things. Your heart will utter perverse things. Yes, you will be like one who lies down in the midst of the sea or one who lies at the top of the, of the mass saying, they have struck me, but oh, I was not hurt. They have beaten me, but I did not feel it. When shall I wait that I may seek another drink? That is a drunken individual who is addicted to wine and they drink and get drunk and they pass out and they wake up and the first thing they want is what? They want to drink. Folks, the Bible teaches plainly, according to this verse, that it was something that God forbid in the Old Testament. Again, in Isaiah 28 and verse 7, you've got another warning. But they also have erred through wine and through intoxicating drink and are out of the way. The priest and the prophet have erred through intoxicating drink. They are swallowed up by wine. They are out of the way through intoxicating drink. They err in vision, they stumble in judgment. Note, if you will, you've got the word wine and intoxicating drink back and forth, which, which gives us the understanding that, that these words are used in a synonymous way. Much like in the book of Matthew chapter 16, verses 18 and 19, the church and the kingdom, they're inter in, in its interchangeable terms. They both mean the same thing. And likewise, when you see the word wine, it's swapping back and forth with intoxicating drink. This is talking about wine in an alcoholic sense, in an intoxicating sense. Look at what it does. It causes individuals to err. It causes individuals to go out of the way. It completely swallows up or consumes their life. It causes them to err in vision. It causes them to stumble in judgment. Needless to say, the Bible is giving a very stern warning uh, concerning intoxicating beverages in the Old Testament. What about the New Testament? Does the Bible in the New Testament, the law by which we live today, does it condemn wine or alcoholic beverages? Let's look and say, note if you will, that the Bible gives a warning against drunkenness. Note if you will, in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, in verses 9 and 10, and Paul opens up this passage by saying, Do you not know that those who are unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? And so he begins, first of all, by saying, Here is a group of those who are unrighteous. This is not an exhaustive list. It's just an, a, an example of some unrighteous people. And what is the condition of unrighteous people? The Bible says they will not inherit the kingdom of God. And note, if you will, in this conglomeration of individuals, you've got the word drunkards. Now, what does the word drunkard mean, or drunken, as you and I might see it in our Bibles? It literally refers to an individual in an intoxicating state. In other words, they have drank to the point to where they are recognized as being drunken or intoxicated. There are other verses in the New Testament where you'll see the basic same thing. For example, in Galatians chapter 5, verses 19 through 21, this passage is talking about the works of the flesh. In those who find themselves caught up in the works of the flesh, note if you will, those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of heaven. And in the conglomeration of these works of the flesh, note if you will, number one, you've got drunkenness, the same word that we saw over in the book of 1 Corinthians chapter uh, 6. And then you've got another word, which is called revelries. Now, when you think about this word, what is it talking about? It's simply talking about drinking parties. You know these parties where people get together and they laugh and talk and they just have a few drinks. They may not necessarily find themselves in a drunken condition, but it's just a good time drinking party. Maybe they're meeting at the local restaurant and they're having a few drinks together or maybe they're meeting at the local bar and they're having a few drinks or maybe they're meeting at the dance hall and they're dancing and having a few drinks. That is what this word is talking about. And note, if you will, that those who participate in such, the Bible plainly says that these individuals shall not inherit the kingdom of God. Now, what a lot of people will do at this particular point is they'll say, well, David, what this is doing is this is condemning drunkenness. And so this is not condemning an individual who is a social 
drinker. And I want you to think about that with me for just a moment. In the state of Georgia, remember that word drunkenness means to be in an intoxicating fashion. Okay, you're intoxicated. You've drank enough to where you are recognized as being intoxicated. In the state of Georgia, when you blow into the breathalyzer, in order to be classified as a legal drunk, you must register what is known as .08 in that little breath meter that you blow into. Okay? .08. In an average can of beer, there is approximately 5% alcohol. In an average glass of wine, there is somewhere between 12 and 15% alcohol. In an average glass of whiskey, or what we might think of as hard liquor, there is somewhere between 50 and 60% alcohol. question is, how much does an individual have to drink to get to the point of drunkenness, recognized as being intoxicated? Right? It depends. In different people, it takes different amounts. It's based upon your weight, your height, and all sorts of different things like that. For example... Let's say, for instance, there's an individual, the average person, it is said, it takes approximately three drinks to get an individual to that point zero eight, all right, where they're classified as being drunk. Not everyone, it takes three drinks. Some people, it might take two. Some people, it might take one. Some people, it takes maybe five or six. But here's the point I want you to see. According to this reasoning, when you take that one drink, you drink that one beer, and it takes three to get you in a drunken condition, what are you when you drink that one beer? You're one drink drunk. Right or wrong? Is that not the re reasoning? That Is that not proper logic? Yes. If it takes three drinks to get an individual drunk, when they drink that first drink, they are one drink drunk. If it takes five drinks, again, one drink drunk. If it takes two drinks, and they take a sip. They're one sip drunk. The point I'm trying to make is the Bible is not just condemning drunkenness in itself, but it is condemning the road or the path that leads an individual to that point of intoxication. And so when you and I look at the Bible, the Bible teaches plainly, both in the Old Testament and the New Testament, intoxicating drink was forbidden by God Himself. Now I want us to look at three passages in the New Testament that individuals will often run to in order to prove that it is perfectly fine to not only drink, but to social drink and do it on a regular basis. And this one is probably no surprise to you. It's found in the book of John chapter 2. Now because of the length of these passages, I did not put them on the PowerPoint. If you have your Bibles open to John chapter 2, I want you to look at this passage with me. You probably recognize it as the time when Jesus went into Cana of Galilee. And you remember the very first miracle that we have recorded that He did. What did He do? He turned the water into wine. And a lot of water into wine. We're talking about somewhere between 120, maybe 150 gallons of wine that Jesus turned water into wine it made it available for the people. Now you've got the word wine used throughout this passage, beginning in verse 1 and going through verse 12. The question that we want to ask ourselves is, was this intoxicating wine? Because what people will do is they'll say, there is Jesus turning water into wine, putting His approval upon it, and Jesus would not have made something that was sinful. The implication to them is that this wine was intoxicating. The point of the matter is, is, you can't prove that. There is absolutely no way to prove that this wine, because that word wine, when you and I see it, it can have either an intoxicating meaning or it can refer to, remember, the fruit of the vine, the cluster, which would have referred to grape juice. And so you cannot just look at the word wine and automatically cons uh, uh, assume that this is talking about fermented beverage. In fact, when you look at the text, the text seems to indicate that they were not in a drunken condition and this was not alcoholic beverage. In fact, look beginning in verse 9. When the master of the feast had tasted the water that was made wine, 
And he did not know where it came from, but the servants who had drawn the water knew. The master of the feast called the bridegroom, and he said to them, Every man at the beginning sets out the good wine, and when the guests have well drunk, then the inferior, but you have kept the good wine until now. Now what is it in that passage that would indicate to you that this was not wine of an alcoholic nature? Note, if you will, the phrase well drunk. What does that indicate? That these people had been drinking for a long time. Okay? When you drink wine for a long time, and it is of an alcoholic nature, tell me what's going to happen. You're going to find yourself in a drunken condition. When you find yourself in a drunken condition, what is one of the first things that goes? Your judgment. You don't know whether you're coming or going. You remember the passage in Proverbs, who has woe and contentions, redness of eyes, don't remember anything, don't know anything, don't know how much they drank, where they got it, or anything like that. They're just ready for another drink. Do you see that condition in this man? No, but rather you see him in the condition that when he tasted this wine, his judgment was not impaired, but rather he had the ability to recognize that this was the good wine. And so the context itself indicates that this is not an intoxicating beverage. Not only that, keep in mind that Jesus lived under the old law, did He not? Galatians 4 and verse 4, He was from the law, born under the law, from a woman under the law. And so He lived under the law. He kept the law perfectly. Did He ever make a mistake? Did he ever commit a sin? Absolutely not. John chapter 8 and verse 46, he could say, which of you can convict me of sin? Now, in order to convict him of sin, they would have to find an old law that he lived by that he violated. Now, there were several passages on the old law, especially the one in Leviticus chapter 10, 9 and 10, that forbade the drinking of wine. What's so interesting about that verse, if you remember, it was a command given to the priest. Now tell me who Jesus is. According to Hebrews chapter 4 and verse 15, He's not just a priest. What kind of priest is He? He's a high priest. He's the highest priest that's ever been known to man. And therefore, if God's ordinary priests were forbidden to drink wine, do you think Jesus did it? Do you think He endorsed it? Absolutely not. Not only that, but the law in the book of Habakkuk chapter 2 and verse 15 forbade giving your neighbor wine or strong drink if jesus had made intoxicating wine then he would have given all of those people there intoxicating drink and he would have violated the law the next passage i want you to consider is the passage in the book of first timothy chapter three <clears throat> first timothy chapter three and the passage is verse eight in talking about the deacons of the church. And the Bible says in this passage, in talking about the qualifications of the deacon in verse 8, likewise decent deacons must be reverent, not double-tongued. Now note the next, not given too much wine. There will be those who will go to this passage and they'll say, okay, that means that he can drink some because he's not to be given too much. The interesting thing is, is that that verse or that word not giving to much wine literally means not addicted. Now tell me what a social drinker is. That individual's addicted. They've got to have that social drink. They can color it any way they want to, but that which I need every night just to sit down, social drink, maybe after supper or in the evening, sitting outside, I mean, it's, it's addictive when an individual concludes this is what they have to have. And that's what the word means. It literally means not addicted. But not only that, consider that phrase, not given too much. And the idea is that it means that you can have a little. In the book of Ecclesiastes chapter 7 and verse 17, listen to what the Bible says. Do not be overly wicked. You hear it? Don't be overly wicked. According to the logic, don't be given to much wine. Does that verse mean that I can be a little wicked? I mean, that is the reasoning and that is the logic. What did Joey read for us in Psalm chapter 
uh, 9 just a few moments ago, the wicked will find themselves in the place of hell. That's what the Bible says. And so this idea that this means a little is not what the Bible teaches. In fact, if you back up into chapter 3, if uh, verse, uh, verse 2, as he's given the qualification of an elder, look at what he says in verse 2 or verse 3. He is not to be given to wine. Why would God say to the leaders of the church that you're not to drink wine and then to say to the deacons of the church, well, you can have a little bit. It's not consistent, is it? Consistency is a message that you and I see in the Bible. And that phrase, not given to much wine, means that they are not to be addicted to it. And the only way that you get addicted to it is by drinking it. Therefore, He is not giving permission to have a moderate amount, but rather He is saying abstain from it, whether it be a moderate amount or an excessive amount. And then the last passage that we want to look at is over in chapter 5 of 1 Timothy, and that is verse 23. And this is the classic passage where people run to, where Paul tells Timothy, no longer drink only water, but use a little wine for your stomach's sake and your frequent infirmities. And people will say there is the biblical permission that an individual can social drink. The first thing that you've got to prove is was this wine of an intoxicating nature? Can you just step upon the platform and say, yes, it was intoxicated? By whose authority? Remember, you, you have to look at the context. And you have to ask yourself, was this intoxicating wine? In fact, doctors have proven today that grape juice is very soothing to the stomach and very pleasant to the stomach. And likewise, it would have been soothing and pleasant to the stomach back then. But even if it was intoxicating wine, I want you to know what has to happen. An apostle of the Lord Jesus Christ has to command it. Paul has to command him. If it was a modern common thing, just drink alcohol whenever you wanted it, then Paul would not have had to give Timothy the command. But because Tim Paul had to command Timothy, it implies within the biblical text that this was not something that they normally did. Not only that, but consider the purpose. Why is it that Paul would say, drink a little wine with the water that you're drinking? It was because of his infirmity. It was because of his sickness. Evidently, Timothy had some kind of trouble with his stomach. They did not have Pepto-Bismol. They did not have Milana. They did not have Toms and Rolades and all the other things that we take for indigestion and heartburn. And therefore, Paul encouraged him to use this for not leisure, but for medicinal purposes, for a medical condition. And so what proves too much often proves too little. Now, last of all, what I want us to do is I want us to answer some arguments about wine. There, there are those who will say that the water was undrinkable in Bible times and therefore they had to drink wine. Well, folks, that's not the teaching of the Bible. How many passages in the Bible do you see where they did drink the water? Uh, so Abraham arose early in the morning, took bread and a skin of what? A skin of water and put it on their shoulder talking about uh, his wife Hagar, his handmaid, Hagar, Sarah's handmaid, Hagar here. He gave it to the boy, to Hagar, sent them away. She departed and wandered in the wilderness of Beersheba. And the water in the skin was used up. How did it get used up? Folks, they weren't watering their feet. They were drinking the water, were they not? And she placed the boy under the shrub. And then God opened her eyes and she saw a well of water. And she went and filled the skin with water and gave the lad a drink. And so the Bible is just literally filled with examples in the Old Testament where they drank the water. Likewise with the New Testament, John chapter 4, verses 5 through 7. So Jesus came to the city of Samaria, which he called Sychar, and did the plot of the ground that Jacob gave to his son Joseph. Now Jacob's well was there. Jesus, therefore, being wearied from his journey, sat thus by, by the well. It was about the sixth hour and a woman of Samaria came to draw water and Jesus said, give me what? Give me to the drink. They drank the water back then. And someone says, no, it's not possible. It had parasites in it. Yeah, they drank it and it had parasites in the water and it had parasites in them. How do you explain that? They became accustomed to it. 
It's much like when I used to go to Nicaragua in South America. My first trip over there was don't drink the water. Don't drink the water. If there's one thing I remember, it was don't drink the water. Don't even take your toothbrush and run it under the water. If you accidentally do it, throw it away. We had a whole suitcase full of toothbrushes because I kept forgetting. I wasn't used to it. There were some people who did not listen to that warning. They drank the water and they became miserably sick. But you know what? I, I watched those Nicaraguans every day go out to a water faucet and drink it like it was nothing. How do you explain that? Their bodies had become used to it. Yes, there were parasites in the water, but that does not mean that they could not drink the water. Then there will be those who will say, well, you know, the word wine in the Bible refers to fermented wine. Every time you see it, we've already seen the beginning of our study. That wasn't true. Sometimes it did refer to fermented wine. Sometimes it did not. Again, the context determines the meaning. Like Ecclesiastes 9 and verse 7, Go eat your bread with joy, drink your wine with a merry heart, for God has already accepted your words. Now I have to ask myself the question, which application or which definition is being applied here? It has to be the good application, the, the fresh-pressed uh, juice that they were being encouraged to drink. And then you look at Proverbs 20 and verse 1. Wine is a mocker, strong drink is raging, or is a brawler, and whoever is led astray by it is not wise. And so you cannot look to the Bible and say every verse is talking about intoxicating wine. Then there are those who will say, well, the process of preserving grape juice was unknown. Boy, is that not a lie. I mean, you think during the time of the Lord's Supper and the kind of bread that they had to use for the Lord's Supper was what kind of bread? You remember? Unleavened bread. Did they understand there were certain things you put in the bread to cause it to rise? Certain things to uh, not put in the bread? Yes, they, they understood that. And do you think that these people of such great intelligence did not know how to preserve grape juice so that it could be used and it could be drank? In fact, you can go back and look at the Zondervan World Dictionary, or Word Picture Dictionary, and it lists several different ways that they knew how to preserve the grape juice back then. And so that argument will not hold water. And then this one is probably one of the most ludicrous that you and I will see. God created grapes from which wine is made, and therefore that implies that He approves of the drinking of wine. Since you can take the grapes that He made and make wine, then, then it, it shows God's approval. Seriously? That's where we want to go? You know, God also made the coca plant from which people make cocaine. Are we going to conclude that God endorses the consumption of cocaine. God also made what we would think of as the opium plant so that individuals could make heroin. Are we to conclude that God endorses the use of heroin? God is the one who made the marijuana plant. Uh, are we to conclude that because He made it, then He endorses the smoking of marijuana? And we could spend the rest of the night chasing this rabbit. Just because of the very fact that God made something does not mean that He endorses an individual taking it and twisting it into something that is not pleasing in the eyes of God. Now folks, we could spend the rest of the night, we probably spent too much time talking about this. I just wanted to be thorough on it and I tried my very best not to leave a stone unturned. But regardless of what we say and regardless of what we do there are going to be those who've got it made up in their mind that they are going to drink they're going to social drink and they're not going to let anyone tell them different and then there are those who are going to say this is what the bible says and i want to do what god says so therefore that's what i'm going to follow the question is which one are you going to do i'm going to follow the bible i don't think that i need to stand here and explain to you which position I hold to. Uh, brothers and sisters in Christ, I think we should follow God's Word to a T. And, and if nothing else, if someone says, well, there's just too much gray in there, there are enough verses in the Bible that should cause a red flag to cause me to see that maybe this is not right. 
and how sad it would be on the day of judgment for an individual to stand before God and all because of one of their selfish desires to hear the words, depart from me, I never knew you. I know sometimes I'm a selfish person, but I don't want to let my selfishness lead me away from heaven, and I certainly don't want it to lead you. You may be here tonight or this evening, you're not a child of God. I want to encourage you to become one, come believing that Jesus is the Son of God, repent of your sins, confess your faith in Christ, the Son of God, be baptized for the remission of sins, and you leave here this evening a child of the living God. Maybe you're here and you're already a child of God, your life is not right. There's some things that you need to change. Whatever your need may be, won't you come as we stand and sing? who's come out this afternoon, who was here this morning, who ate the meals with us. It's been a fabulous day, just like David said. And we certainly do thank each and every one who's come out. Please come back Wednesday evening for another wonderful Bible study. And we invite everybody there. If you do not have opportunity to partake of the Lord's Supper at the morning hour, please go down this hallway to the library and somebody will meet you there very shortly with the Lord's Supper for you. After another song, we'll have our closing prayer and then be dismissed. Is there any other announcements? Any of you elders need anybody to say something? Deacon? Okay, we're going to sing I will call upon the Lord. And then we'll have a closing, closing prayer. Oh, I will call upon the Lord. Bow with me as we pray together. 
Our God and Father in heaven, again, we're so thankful for another day of life. Thankful for the opportunities that you've given, in, given us in this day to serve and to honor you. We pray that we will live our lives as Christians on every day of the week and not on this day only. That you will find us well pleasing in thy sight. We are most especially thankful for thy Son and our Savior who gave his life for us. We pray that you will help us to ever keep him in our memories as we live each day and that we will strive to follow in the steps that he left for us to follow. We're thankful for this congregation of people here at Lafayette. Thankful for the works that go forth in this place and we pray that you will help us all to not grow weary in well-doing and we will continue to walk our lives in the paths of righteousness. We will continue to spread the blessed gospel wherever we go. We're thankful for the power of the gospel. Thankful for these messages that we've heard tonight and this after, this morning. And we pray that you will help us to place these things in our lives, searching them within thy word and find them so and living them out faithfully in thy sight. We're ever so mindful of all those who are sick, those who weren't able to be with us today. Pray that you will restore them to much needed help if it be thy will. We know that you know what's best for us in this life, and we pray that you will continue to provide everything that is necessary for us to continue life. Be with us now as we depart this place. Bring us back next point in time, and pray that we will ever keep our minds and attentions focused upon heaven, that you will forgive us where we fail thee, when we come to the end of life's way, we'll live eternally with thee in heaven. In Jesus' name, amen.